Hey, good evening, everyone. It's great to see you. Uh, my name is Peter Kwong. I'm currently serving as one of the ministers here in the New Market Church, and I want to really welcome you uh, to our class tonight. We're doing a two-part series called Devoted, and tonight we have a very special class in store for you. We're going to be eating and feasting spiritually. Uh, our very own Leo Tiawin is going to be teaching a class on the Holy Spirit. It's going to be amazing and fantastic. I'm so encouraged. We've got disciples from the Hamilton Church. Uh, I see Greg and Nancy there and the Halifax Church and some others. Uh, we got disciples in Ottawa and Newmarket and uh, just encourages my soul to see so many of you uh, faithful disciples here tonight. Uh, it's great to have you. I just want to read a scripture for you kind of to set our hearts and our minds on what we're going to be doing tonight. And of course, we've got to go to the We've got to go to the book of Acts, and this really uh, helps us to understand what it was like for these early Christians after they had found the Messiah, Jesus. It says here in Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That's what we're doing tonight. And to the fellowship. That's what we're doing tonight as well. And to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. I hope you're filled with awe tonight to be worshiping God together. And many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together. We're not together physically, but we can be together virtually. Amen. And had everything in common. Of course, you and I, we have a common savior, a common faith, a common kingdom. We're part of a common church. And that's why we're here tonight to be edified and encouraged and built up in our amazing adventure and journey as we walk with Christ. But it's really great to see you. Thank you for joining us. As I mentioned to you, Leo Tewin is gonna be our teacher tonight. Uh, in case you don't know Leo, Leo has served in the ministry for I believe about 40 years. Uh, tons of experience uh, has led in many different capacities. One capacity is he actually served as a kingdom teacher uh, for a short while. And so uh, he is a man who knows the scriptures, loves the scriptures, and is constantly uh, diligently digging in, trying to find new insights, not just for his own soul's sake, but even to share with other disciples to encourage and build them up. Um, so I hope that you are encouraged tonight. I'm going to turn it over to Greg right now. He's going to start us with a prayer, and then we're going to jump right into it. After the prayer, Leo's going to come in and start the class. Hey, man. Thank you, Peter. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for this time that we can gather together tonight. Father, that you have given us the means and the ways to be able to connect and to be able to see, Father, so many familiar faces to meet new faces. But, Father, more importantly, we'll be gathered together as, as your sons and daughters, as brothers and sisters tonight to, to fellowship, to be encouraged, and uh, really just to, to soak in, uh, Father, the power of your word. But Father, thank you so much for Leo and what he's about to teach us tonight. And Father, that we will uh, we'll be great students tonight, uh, bless his time, and Father, really unleash the power of your spirit through your word, uh, Father, that uh, that we get to uh, get to to hear and and to be ministered tonight, Father, be with each of us as we're on our journey, following you, at uh, various stages uh, in our in our Christian walk and our devotion to you, Father, bless us, increase our faith, uh, continue to watch over us as you always do. But thank you, Father, thank you for this opportunity, for this privilege to listen to your word tonight. So, Jesus, we pray, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Greg. It's good to be with you. Uh, I don't know who made the decision to ask me to be here, but I do feel privileged. It's uh, wonderful to actually get to speak to people all over Canada. Uh, that's a unique experience in and of itself and uh, really excited. Uh, I do have to give you a bit of a disclaimer before we begin this class. I am not going to be able to tell you everything that you want to know about the Holy Spirit. Uh, I've entitled this class, The Essence of God. There is no way that we, with our mortal minds, can understand 
the complexity of God. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about why God has chosen different ways to try to reveal his character. But at the end of the day, it's very hard to understand God until that day we see him as we gather around his throne in heaven. I'm very intimidated about teaching this class because I don't want to leave you with expectations uh, that might confuse you or lead you in a wrong direction. But nonetheless, the Bible is there for us to read and understand, and the Spirit works through various avenues to give us knowledge and truth. And so I'm going to try to share with you my understanding. I'm going to share my screen with you at this time. If I can, there we go. Let's see, there we go. And... The title of our lesson, The Holy Spirit, The Essence of God, I want to be able to share with you what I've come after years of study and trying to understand the Holy Spirit. Uh, it is very hard, in my estimation, to understand the role of the Holy Spirit as accurately as I would like. Um, there are a lot of questions that I still have, and one day, you know, as you stand before the Lord, we'll be able to answer them. I think this helps us. It's it's a bit of a rudimentary dot, you know, diagram, but if you look at it, it kind of gives you the sense of God. God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We understand that. Yet the reality is, and I don't know that you all know this, but that is actually relatively a new concept. It isn't a concept that you find in the, the Old Testament. Uh, what we call the Trinity, which is really a man-made term, it's not a biblical term, but we call it the Trinity, but the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit aren't really discussed in the Old Testament. It's only when we get to the New Testament that we find this concept revealed to us. And it's very important that you understand where that came from. This is actually one of the first times that, that and this is Jesus, obviously, as he speaks, who describes to us this concept of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. And Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. You see, Jesus tied the three together. At baptism, it is kind of the formula the tradition that we, you know, as we baptize someone, we say we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is important for us to understand the significance of that, though, as Jesus said it uh, at the time that he did. In John chapter 5, verse 18, something happens. I, I need you to understand something. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but even calling God his own Father making himself equal with God. The Bible teaches us that Jesus called God his father. The people of their day thought that was blasphemy. You cannot call God the father. That to them was, you're saying you're of equal, you know, equality with God. It upset them. They wanted to kill him. You see, the personification of God as the Father is a New Testament term. It's not really an old, it, it mentions, you know, that Israel, uh, you know, God gave birth to Israel, a kind of a, a generic sense, but not in the specific sense or the personal sense that God is my personal Father. Jesus, when he teaches us to pray, what's the first thing he says? Our Father who art in heaven. He teaches us this concept of God being a Father. Now, Jesus is not just personified. He comes to this earth in the flesh, and he, above all, reveals more about God than any other thing that's ever happened. It's very hard for us to understand God. He's invisible. We don't see God. And it is impossible for us in many ways to relate to the concept of an eternal creator God having no beginning and having no end. We're frail. We are, 
we begin, we end. We have, you know, all of the frailties of the human flesh. God doesn't have that. And I believe it was God's plan. That's why the Old Testament is so, in some ways, difficult to relate to, because people couldn't really understand the character and nature, the essence of God. That's why he calls himself, as the New Testament is revealed, I am the Father. Jesus is the Son. And then we get to the Holy Spirit. It's very important that you understand this in Matthew chapter 3, though, verse 16 and 17, as Jesus is baptized, the Father says, this is my Son, whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. You see, God calls Jesus his Son. He is now the Father. Jesus is the Son. If you go with me to uh, try to understand the Spirit, though, he's often referred to as a dove. You see photos, you know, of the Spirit. It's always a, a white dove. These are similes, okay? He's not a dove. A simile is something that's like something, but not in reality that. He's like fire. He's like a breath. He's like wind. He's called the comforter. We've got to understand all of these concepts that are trying to help us understand the very concept of the spirit, which is a little harder. It's easier to understand Jesus because Jesus came to this earth and reveal the very character, nature, the, the thoughts of God, the will of God, the thing that they, you know, God wanted us to do. He, he is the one that is the spokesman for God. Now, let's talk about the human trinity. This has often been used, and I understand it. It helps me a little bit understand what this Father, Son, and Spirit is all about, because each human has a body, a soul, and a spirit. That in itself, now, I understand the body probably better. The, 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 you know, the concept of soul and spirit, it's a little harder for me to even understand my own spirit, let alone the spirit of God. But the reality is that we are an imitation of God. God is the father. Jesus is the son. And then we have the spirit. So we have this trinity. It's interesting that you can maybe, this is just a rudimentary Example, not a great one, but it somehow catches some of this. If you talk about H2O, the, the chemical, you know, formula for water, H2O, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. It's in liquid. That's water. It's in ice. That's a solid. It's in uh, a gas, a vapor. But the H2O never changes, you see. It's always the same essence, no matter how you find the form of it. And that's the reality of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The essence of God is defined as the Father, Son, and the Spirit. Tonight, we're trying to understand what the Spirit is. <clears throat> In Hebrew, the original inspired language of the Tanakh, Old Testament, the word ruach can be constructed. Uh, construed as a person. It is a person. He is invisible and like wind because he can, can be felt or experienced, but not be seen. That's very important for you understand that, people. We don't see the spirit, but we see the effect of the spirit. Just like we don't see wind, but we see it rustling the, the leaves of the trees. You say, he is the breath of God, which is, disperses his life force, his energy, his intense, his mind. He is Yahweh's spirit, which is omnipresent, but also can be directed in specific ways for specific purposes. He is not the father, first person of the Trinity, or the son, second person, that manifests itself in the world, or which comes to dwell in the hearts and the lives of people. Rather, he is the Holy Spirit, the third person, the triune God. He is God's spirit. We need to understand that first and foremost, okay? The Bible says in John chapter 4, 23 and 24, God is spirit. He is not flesh. Jesus is the, 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 the one element of God that, that became flesh and dwelt among us. But the reality is that God as a whole is spiritual. He is not fleshly in any way. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, this is, this is amazing. The first few verses of the Bible, and what are we introduced to? 
in the, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. The Spirit of God was at work, transforming all of the plans and the intent of God into the reality of this world, this universe that we would we would uh, be a part of. In 2 Corinthians, and this is important as we try to understand what the Spirit is. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 7 through 13. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that's been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time get, began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they'd not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit is from, from God. So we can may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but words taught by the Spirit, explaining all. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> this is important for us to understand. Every person is defined by the thoughts that they have. Who knows the thoughts of the man except that Spirit that is with him? You see, it gives us a little bit of understanding of the role of the Spirit within the human. And it is so with God, too, that in the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. You see, the Spirit is the way for God to reveal the very essence, the very character, the very, you know, the, the, the exact DNA, so to speak, the H2O, you know, not water, but you, you understand if, if we could give him a chemical you know, uh, form. It, it, that's what we find when the spirit is at work. And the spirit is at work in this world, revealing the very essence of God. So we can better understand who he is. First point I want to share tonight, I only have two points, the spirit and his importance. The spirit, what's he do? He reveals to us the will of God, okay? God's word and God's will. In 2 Peter chapter 1, 21, for prophecy never had its origin uh, in the human will, but prophets, through though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It is very important we understand the Spirit is the reason we have the Bible. Okay, all of the thoughts that God wanted us to understand, all of the will that he has for us as we live our lives is revealed to the the, through the medium of the Holy Spirit. This is the mind of God being put down on paper. It is given to the prophets. The prophets share those words, and those words come to us, and now we for thousands of years have been living by them. The work of the Spirit is so very important. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 10 through 12, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was uh, to come to you, searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them, they're not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look in these things. Guys, it's so exciting when you think about it, that we have had the gospel preached to us. God has revealed his very spirit, his thoughts, his will, his intent through the Holy Spirit, and we have that on paper. That's why the Bible is so very important. That's why we, we ask people to read it. You know, read it every day. Try to understand, grow, you know, learn more and more about the very character of God. The Holy Spirit, this is very important. The Holy Spirit is our seal of redemption. 
you know, I have four kids. Connie and I have four children, four sons. And uh, some of you know those boys. If you look at them, there's probably a lot of you that would recognize us in them, especially that my boys are all over six feet. They're tall. They're, you know, they, they've got the, the bit of the T1 gene, which is, you know, to be tall and skinny. Well, I used to be skinny, but not anymore. But, you know, the seal of redemption is important. In Ephesians 1, verse 13, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of our salvation. When we believed, we were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. You see, as we begin this relationship in God, with God, in a, in a very spiritual sense, the spirit comes within us. We become the temple of God, housing the very spirit, and that spirit becomes the seal of that relationship. Wow. I don't even understand what all that means, but I like it. Okay. I like the sound of that. That's, that's something that, you know, people can look at a disciple who's following God, obeying the will of God, and see that this is God at work, that, that we reflect the image of God through the way that we live, the way that we speak, the way that we act. The Spirit transforms the Christian in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And we all who are with unveiled faces contem contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You see, our lives as Christians, you start off as a a baby Christian, and you begin that journey, and as you read your Bible and the Spirit's at work in your life, you're changing every day. You know, you become more and more like the image of Jesus. It's an ever-increasing glory that comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You see, the Spirit's at work. How do we know that? Well, guess what? In Galatians 5, 22 through 25, the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithful, genesis, self-control. You see, that's the Spirit at work in your life. Don't you have more self-control today than you did the first day you became a disciple? Don't you have more love, more peace, more forbearance? Where did that come from? Well, it's the fruit of the spirit. The spirit bears fruit in your life because you've committed your life into following the word that the spirit has given you, the Bible. And as you live that life and the spirit is within you as a seal, you change. You're being transformed and you look more and more like the Jesus, the Christ who saved you. Here becomes the very important question though. How do we get the, the spirit? Where does the Spirit come? When does the Spirit come into our lives? Well, Jesus tells us very plainly in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. How can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked, Surely they cannot enter a second time into the mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at me, my, at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. You see that Jesus says you've got to, in order to enter the kingdom of God, you've got to be born of water. And the spirit, you see, the spirit and water are the two ingredients that give birth to you as a disciple. The spirit is at work in your life and at your baptism, the beginning of that journey, you enter into a relationship with God, a spirit filled relationship. In Acts chapter two, verse 38. Wow. Peter, fine, you know, this is, we're going to talk about this next week. We're going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding what that is. But, you know, the Spirit is sent on, in the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And now Peter is preaching the gospel for the first time 
you know, he didn't know anything, to be honest. He was always sticking his foot in it. But finally, the spirit comes and he's he's now got a clearer mind, a, an understanding of God's will and the whole plan for man. And in Acts 2, verse 38, as they say, brothers, what shall we do? You know, they're convicted because they crucified the Christ. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, he ties it together. There's the water and the spirit. At baptism, the water, you enter into a relationship with Jesus. You're buried and you're raised up out of the, the waters of baptism to begin a new life. Your sins are forgiven, and then you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Wow, wow, wow. That's exciting when you think about it. I mean, come on. What's the best gift you've ever had? How about the gift of the Holy Spirit? Let, let's just lay it out, okay? The best gift you've ever had is the Spirit enabling you and empowering you to live that spiritual life that you so desired. That's why you became a disciple. In Matthew, or Acts chapter 19, I've got to point this out because some people don't understand it. They don't think baptism is essential in the spiritual journey. That, you know, they think it's, it, it's okay, but it's not necessarily essential. In Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 5, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples, asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Interesting question, right? Why do you think Paul asked that question? It's almost a strange question. It's like, hey, if you meet some guys, do you just say, hey, my name's Leah. What's your name? Oh, great. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? That's kind of a like, what? They answered, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. You see how unschooled this, this is because the Spirit was now being revealed in the New Testament as he'd been poured out on the day of Pentecost. People began to understand more of the role of the Spirit. So if people are like out there, well, I don't even know that there is a Spirit. Paul says, well, then what baptism? Look at how he equates their lack of knowledge of the Spirit with the baptism. Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. You see, they were baptized, but it wasn't to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit had not been sent. John preached and wanted people to be baptized and change their life and begin that journey. But that journey did not include the gift of the Spirit. That only came in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. In Mark chapter 1, verse 4, that's what we learned. So John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching of baptism and repentance for the forgiveness of sins. You see, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins, but it did not include that other element. The element of you got to be born of water and the spirit. You got to be baptized, and then you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. In John chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to turn saying, I need to baptize you. Can you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And John consented. You say, even Jesus, who was guilty of no sin, we know that, said, I have to fulfill this because John is a prophet sent by God commanding people to be baptized, Jesus said, I must be obedient to what God is saying through this prophet John. And he says, I have to do this to fulfill all righteousness. It doesn't have the same you know, uh, effect as it would for those who were sinners, because he wasn't a sinner. But Jesus felt it was so important that he submitted to what God said through the prophet John. In conclusion, brothers and sisters, Galatians chapter 5, 16 through 18. So I say, live by the Spirit, that you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. <coughs> 
we got to understand how important it is that we have the spirit in our life. And this is the conflict I think that disciples will have till the day they die. The desires of the flesh are always there. <clears throat> the desire to get angry, to lust, uh, the desire to eat too much or drink too much or or say things uh, you know that you shouldn't say or watch things you shouldn't watch. Those, those desires are always there. And then the spirit is at work also contradicting, kind, kind of get us back on the, the road that we know we should be walking on. It is the spirit that is, is in an essence inside of us in conflict with those fleshly desires. Our spirit, the spirit of God, fighting with our fleshly desires. It's so important that you understand how this spirit is needed in our journey. We sometimes downplay the importance of the spirit in our lives. Uh, sadly, I think, because we don't really understand the spirit. I don't have to understand how God works to know that he's working. You see, he's doing things all the time that just amaze. You know, you pray something and then, ooh, you know, we, we, we recently got our shot, you know, our vaccine and Connie and I were, you know, like we both prayed because it's uh, as of the Wednesday, you know, any, anyone over 65 could uh, apply. And we're both praying, God, you know, we've heard all kinds of nightmares about how to get on these, you know, websites and what to do. And, and we just pray, you know, in my quiet time, I was praying, Connie was praying in her class. We got on those things and you know what? It was a little tricky, but it's amazing. Like, whoop, wow, I'm in. How did I, I don't know how this happened. It's like, yeah, I do. God, God's working all the time doing things, you know, and it's, it's very comforting to know that the spirit is at work in your life. It, it, it propels you in your spiritual journey. In Romans chapter eight, five through nine, this is very important. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. Those who live according to the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. The mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by flesh is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ. Uh, oh, I can't read that last part there. Uh, then they do not belong to Christ. Thank you, Connie. What is so important about this relationship with the Spirit? You see, the Spirit is, remember, he was that, that mark, that, that seal of our redemption. If you do not have the Spirit, you aren't sealed with the Spirit. You do not belong to Christ. Whoa, Z, that's scary. That's scary. We need to be careful about what we expose our flesh to, our minds to, because the constant battle is in the mind with the flesh, trying to choose. You know, Satan is putting all kinds of temptations in our path. The spirit is at work trying to keep us on the righteous path, following in the footsteps of Jesus. Now, uh, I'm going to get out of this. There we go. I'm back with you guys. I'd like to take a question and answer period. I don't know how this is going to work because there's too many of you for me to see all of you. So if you have a question, just put it on the chat line, if you would. Um, and uh, we'll try to answer any questions that come along. I'm sure that I've answered uh, some of your questions, but there may be others. Only easy ones, though, okay? I only want easy questions. Just kidding. Boy, tough crowd. <laughs> I don't see anything. Anybody? Can we... Who's this? Juliana Dantra. Okay, from Hamilton. Uh, how can we better listen to the Holy Spirit or be led by the Spirit? 
I think we have to protect ourselves to a great degree from some of the things of the world. You know, the flesh can be enticed by certain things. Um, TV can be, uh, you know, a pitfall. What do you do? I love to have my spiritual time with God. I listen to music. I love music. I just play, you know, I get on my uh, elliptical and I plug in uh, my earphones and I just, you know, I listen to spiritual songs the whole time. I'm trying to get a little exercise. It, it changes my internal perspective, if you understand what I'm saying. So we do have to protect ourselves. Am I saying that you shouldn't watch TV? You shouldn't read certain books. You shouldn't listen to the news. You should, you know, there's all kinds of things that, you know, extremes that groups have got to. And I understand that. But I do think that we need to protect our, our, our minds, our flesh from some of the things. And you know that, okay? If you know the certain things that are really weak, cause you to feel spiritually weak, stay away from them. Stay away from them. There's a lot of questions coming in now. Honey, do you have any? I'm talking to my wife here. She's sitting beside <laughs> me. I didn't call you guys, honey. Okay. Um, anyone is here that I should be looking at? Uh, from Shavit, everyone. If the spirit was only given after the resurrection, did the prophets of Old Testament have the spirit with them? Yes. If you look at the Old Testament, you will see uh, this. The question is that the spirit was only given after the resurrection. Did the prophets of the Old Testament have the spirit with them? He wasn't given only, it wasn't after the resurrection. It was only, uh, when, yes, when Jesus returned to God, he poured forth the spirit. But the reality was the spirit was beginning. You know, as I read Genesis 1, the spirit was hovering over the waters. He's been at work through the prophets. He, was, he enabled the prophets to speak the words that they spoke he gave them the truth, the words, the, the will of God. No, no, the Spirit was at work in the Old Testament, but he wasn't in the relationship that is unique. And that is the relationship that comes after Jesus goes back to the Father and receives the promised Holy Spirit that he pours forth that allows us then at our baptism to be not only forgiven of our sins, but receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, oh, Tim Chant, how do we know when the Spirit has left someone? I don't know, Tim. That's a that's a great question. Well, it's a great question. I don't know if that's a great question. It's kind of <laughs> difficult. I don't have an answer to that one at all. Um, it's hard to know when the spirit leaves someone. Now I can, you know, I've seen people, you know, who've on their spiritual journey as disciples, and then they turn their back on, give up. I don't want to read my Bible. I don't want to go to church. I don't want to talk to anybody. And you can see in the kind of lifestyle that they choose. Sometimes you can really see that the spirit is no longer working in that person's life because they're living a very, unspiritual life that's easier to understand but you know does the spirit and maybe this is your question tim i don't know does the spirit leave us you know we have a hard day and and you know we're we're kind of feeling really down or we're we're guilty of some sin that really is entangled us and did the spirit leave us i don't think so that's why god is our father okay I have, as I mentioned, four kids. They've done a lot of things in their days that have been difficult for their mother and I to deal with. Now, they're not bad kids. They're not, they're not kids. They're men. But they're always our kids. And so we don't change anything in our relationship. Uh, we don't sever the relationship because of the way they something that's happened in their life. That's that's the relationship of a son and a, and a daughter to their father. And the spirit doesn't leave us, you know, because, oh, we, we sinned and now the spirit's gone and we repent and the spirit comes back. No, 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 no. The spirit, we become a temple of the Holy Spirit and the spirit lives within that temple. The whole time we continue in our journey as a disciple. <coughs> Next, honey. 
uh, someone uh, asked, can you, uh, Owen and Valerie, can you explain a bit about the work of the spirit in changing us to want to be baptized? Um, yes, that's a good question. Can you explain a bit about the work of the spirit in changing us to want to be baptized? The spirit works in mysterious ways. I, I, there are things that motivate me that aren't necessarily from the Bible. The Bible motivates me. I read it and I, I just get all jazzed all the time. But there's other things that happen too. I can hear a song. Sometimes I hear a song and it, it just makes me feel spiritual. The spirit can work through many things, through many avenues. I've seen movies. I, I, <laughs> oh, what was that movie called uh, about the, uh, the, the ghosts? Ghost? I think it was called Ghost. Do you remember that movie? Some of you might. We saw that movie, man. That scared me to death. That that didn't didn't motivate. Well, it motivated me spiritual because you know at the end those black things or those things come up and you know drag them away. It's like, oh boy, <laughs> I don't want. I don't think it's true. I don't know. Well, I shouldn't say it. I don't know. But the reality is, man, that that had an impact on me. It was like, okay, I, I get it. I, I I need to you know take heed to the journey I'm on and make sure that I'm walking in the right way because things like that can happen. So I don't I don't want to limit the spirit in any way. It can be you know through your parents' influence. It can be through a friend's influence. It can be through a uh, you know a movie, a song. It can be through many many things that the spirit can work that touches our inner self and motivates us to a, you know, choose a greater spiritual journey. And uh, so I hope that helps. Can, uh, here I've got a quick Greg Taylor. This note came to my inbox from Ron, Ron Petter. Hi, thanks for the lesson. I've always found it difficult when reading to understand spirit, capital S versus spirit. As I read the passing context at the time, the different translations uh, seem uh, arbitrary. Wow. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Ron. <laughs> Your PhD shines through. <laughs> uh, I don't know if how arbitrary it is. I don't think that, that God arbitrarily, as he reveals the word, uh, it's it's not arbitrary. Everything has particular me. I that's what I love about the, the Bible. You know, you can find a scripture that can explain so much, you know, that, uh, you, you know, I heard someone just the other day say, yeah, Jesus went to hell to preach to people in hell. It's like, no, no, he didn't. He didn't do that. Because I can, you know, I look at that scripture and I know exactly what he's talking about. What's the whole purpose of preaching? Preaching is to change people's hearts. You to go, go to hell to preach because you can't change anybody. Anyway, that's that you know, that's <laughs> everything has is not arbitrary in my estimation. Everything is distinct, and there's a reason for it because God has a huge plan. I don't know if that helped, right? <laughs> you would give me the hard ones. I told you easy ones. <laughs> How do you know if something is of the works of the spirit or not just emotions? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, who asked? Oh, Katie. <laughs> Katie, you did that. <laughs> um, part of it is emotions. Part of the emotions that we have, I think, tap into the spiritual side of our, our, our being, uh, which is very important. Some people are more emotional than others, but, you know, Emotional people don't aren't guaranteed to become Christians. Uh, I know a lot of non-emotional people that are Christians too. You know, uh, it, it, but I think that the the emotion that we have can be a asset, but then sometimes it can be a detriment too, because sometimes our emotion, you know, may convince us something, uh, you know, to believe something that isn't true, that's a lie, for example, like. You know, oh, I'm so bad. I can't get to heaven. I'm, you know, we have this concept of, you know, uh, this guilt that, you know, re residue in our lives that that uh, keeps us from having the confidence 
uh, that Jesus wants us to have as we walk in our journey as disciples. So um, I'm one of, you know, people don't know this, but I'm the emotional one in my family. Connie's not the emotional one I am. Uh, and, you know, oh, yeah, don't look so surprised, Katie. I can see you. <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, it's just, but that doesn't, you know, that that doesn't change anything. I mean, my DNA is just a little bit different than hers, um, you know. She she doesn't cry at commercials and I do so, whatever. Uh, How do good, you know if a decision is spirit led? How do you know if a decision is spirit led? Well, that's a really tough one. I don't, and I don't think I can give you a succinct answer that's going to uh, qualify all the decisions that you make. What do you do when you have a decision? Like, let's say changing jobs. This, you know, you have a job and you've got this opportunity. How do you know that that's a good thing? Well, what do you do? You use all of the tools available for you. You Number one, check the scriptures to see, you know, if, if it means that you have to get up at four in the morning and drive two hours and then come home at eight at night, you know, and you get to see your kids for 20 minutes before they go to bed. Yeah, maybe that, you know, you check the scriptures to see if that's how you, you know, would fulfill your role as a father or a mother. Uh, but you don't, you know, you, you check the scriptures, then you check friends. What do you think, guys? What, you know, I'm thinking of doing this. What do you think? Would that be good? Would it not? Get input, in other words. Seek, you know, some sort of wisdom from outside of your own brain. Because when you get lost inside of your head, sometimes you can't think very clearly and you need you need clarity from somebody outside of it. And there's many times, I tell you, many times that I've done that. Then you obviously pray about it. You pray a lot about it, uh, you know, and you 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 lay it out. The, the, uh, you know, the, the in Romans chapter eight, it describes how the spirit intercedes for us with with words that, you know, when we don't know how to pray the way we want, the Spirit is the one that's interceding and bringing that to God, the Father, and saying, this is what the, you know, this is what this person wants. So I don't know if that, at, at some point you do make a decision and you believe it to be the right decision. That's just the way it is, right? Uh, it, it just happens. Uh, not always, not always. They're not always clear decisions that can be seen. Spirit really help you find something on the internet. Did the spirit help me to find something on the internet? Oh, did it? Well, yeah, all the time. I go to the internet all the time to find stuff. Uh, Just yeah. the spirit guides you in doing that. I think so. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I wanted to check out something. I'm not sure. Is that you know? I used to have a concord. Well, I still have a concordance. It weighs about 50 pounds. You know, now you just go on the internet and you just click in a few and, you know, Google Google it and you can find all kinds of things really quickly. Yeah, I believe the Spirit's working on the internet. I believe the Spirit's working, you know, even through the fact that I would have these questions, you know, as he instills inside my mind as I've prepared for this. I've been preparing for this for two or three weeks. You know, I've constantly, oh, yeah. And then I would go, oh, let me check that out. So, you know, I remember a lot of scriptures, but I don't remember all of them anymore. So the internet kind of becomes my memory. Next question. How do you know if a decision is, oh, I did that one. Um, in Acts 19, why did Paul ask if they received the Holy Spirit when they believed, if we receive it when we are baptized? Well, they remember in Acts 19, they did not receive the Holy Spirit. They didn't even know that there was a Holy Spirit. So they were baptized, but that was John's baptism. That was a sort of a, how would I put this? That's like the rinse cycle in your wash machine. <laughs> it didn't get all, it didn't get everything done. Okay. Only in, when Jesus, you know, Jesus comes and sends the Holy Spirit, and then Peter gets up and reveals the full truth of salvation. They had a partial understanding of how to be forgiven, but they had no concept of this Spirit. And so now Peter's preaching with through the power of the Spirit. We're going to talk about that next week, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so now they can now be forgiven, 
and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's linked, just as Jesus did in John 3, verse 5. So you see, there's there, there, that's why Paul could have as, as easily asked, have you been baptized? Well, what would they have said? Yes. That wasn't clear enough for him. He wanted to know which baptism, because I believe those people that were baptized by, you know, by John had to be baptized again to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How do I know that? Because that's exactly what happened in, in Acts chapter 19. Next question. Anybody? We done? Okay, guys, I think I have to. Oh, I got two minutes till eight. Wow. The Spirit led me properly with the timing today. <laughs> There's an example of the Spirit at work. <laughs> that little thing that nudges inside you. Okay. Um, all right. No other questions? I don't know how you many. Know, I think yes. there's one more question in the chat. There is? Yeah. Who? I shall read it. It says in Ephesians 4 30, it says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. What do you mean by do not grieve the Holy Spirit? Does the Holy Spirit have feelings? Absolutely. You say, remember, I'm talking about the Spirit as the essence of God. And that is the, the very internal mechanism. The spirit is that which is inside of us. And yes, the grieve the Holy Spirit is to, you know, the spirit sees someone who turns their back on, on the father and, and chooses another lifestyle. That grieves the Holy Spirit. It, it's upsetting. It, it's difficult to watch. I, I, for those of us who have children, you know what that's like. Have you ever seen your kids do something that you go, oh, boy, that's really bad. That's going to hurt them. And it does, you know, and it's like, oh, I wish I didn't see that or I wish that didn't happen. It, it grieves us to see those that we love choose a path of pain, torment, agony, whatever. Is that it? So, I, Randy, I think someone had asked a couple of times what book they to study about the spirit or something like that. <laughs> oh boy. Sorry, they Better asked. Ask Ron. Where's Ron? <laughs> I don't read a lot of books. I just read the Bible. So I, I'm not a I'm not really the best person to ask about um, you know, the best. I mean, there's lots of material. Go on the internet. Apparently you, you can go on the internet and the spirit can lead you. <laughs> Just kidding. Lighten up, you guys. You're looking a little tense. <laughs> um, so no, I, I don't. I don't. Wouldn't recommend a book because I just don't read enough spiritual books. I do read spiritual books, but not, I haven't read a good one on that. So I'm sure if you go through uh, to the church webs, um, what's it called? Not disciples today, but the the it's changed now. The name of it, where you can get uh, you know books. Illumination written. Publications. What's it called? Illumination Publications. That's it. Put it yeah. uh, Illumination Publication. That's the the go on that site and look up Holy Spirit. I'm sure you'll find some. All right. Any other questions? Mm. <laughs> what did you say, William? I'm dead. LOL. <laughs> Why are you dead, William? I'm just responding to one of the comments. That's uh, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, right. You guys. Hi, well, it's hi Leo. Oh, oh, hi, Leo. It's, hi, Leo. It's Suzette. Uh, hey, it's, Suzette. Faster, it's faster for me to, to speak than to type. Um, can you talk a little bit about keeping in step with the spirit? Yeah. Yeah. Um, When you're, let's say if you read the Bible four hours a day, I'm guessing you're in, in step with the Spirit. Now I'm kidding, of course, because no one can do that. Or, you know, you all have jobs and so on. But, you know, this, the word itself keeps you in step. That's why we ask you to, you know, we, we really encourage people as they become new disciples, read every day. 
you know, pray every day because that helps you in that spiritual journey. But, um, you know, if you go to Galatians 5 again, you know, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. Look at that and do, you know, do a checklist. You know, we, at the beginning of the year, we always, you know, well, I'm going to lose 10 pounds. Or, you know, you make out all of these things that you're going to change in your life uh, in the new year. Uh, make a checklist of that and say, you know, how am I doing? Am I as loving as I was? So, you know, if you're, uh, if you're growing in the love, like if you find that you're more loving now than you were the day you were baptized, you're in step with the Holy Spirit. You see, the fruit of the Spirit is proof of the Spirit at work in your life, whether it be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, or genesis, and self-control. So you, we can see all of that. It's a real helpful way of, um, you know, maybe measuring. And that's not, a, that, that's not, you can't measure that, okay? I shouldn't say that because we're terrible. We're, we, we tend to measure everything and think that, you know, well, I'm a better Christian today than I was yesterday. Nah, it don't work that way, okay? You're a son of God or a daughter of God, and you're the same, you're, you're in that same relationship today or tomorrow or yesterday. It's, it never changes. You see, my kids don't become more my kids if they do everything I ask them to do. They're always my kids. I have that relationship with them as the father. And so the father has with us. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. That's it. Are we good? Uh, I'm going to end in a word of prayer. And then... Uh, we will see you next week. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that our lesson tonight has displayed and educated and inspired us all to understand you better. Father, I pray that we haven't limited your work in any way, that your spirit can provide for us the, uh, the wisdom we need, the strength that we need, the confidence that we need, that the Spirit would guide our feet so that we would walk away from the sin that so easily entangles us. And, you know, Father, eat the fruit of the Spirit every day of our lives so that we can become more and more like Jesus, that we could be ever increasing in the glory of our Lord and that people would see us and think, truly, we are different. Thank you so much for your Bible, your word, your prophets who gave it to us. I thank you, Father, for your son who walked on this earth as an example and uh, can help us to understand more clearly uh, what it is uh, or, or who you are, your very essence. Thank you, Father, that you love us, that you chosen the relationship of father to children so that we can uh, look to you as our Holy Father and uh, Climb upon your knee one day, Father, and look in your eyes and, and be encouraged by the uh, words, well done, good and faithful servant. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. Have a great time.